Hi, my name is Dan Dixo. I uh, worked various jobs at the park, starting with a being a change person. I worked for John Rinaldi as a maintenance mechanic. I worked there as a police officer, nights on Saturdays and Sundays. And I also worked in concessions, uh, the grocery concession uh, for Lippy and Sadie Harris, and uh, also worked for the Nickel Pitch. I guess I was about, um, when I started working at the park, I must have been, uh, I guess about 15, 15 years, I'm 77 now. So, and it was just dumb luck to get the job there in the first place with the, uh, being a change person. Um, but then the, the park wouldn't allow me to work the hours that the owner of the concession wanted. The owner of the concession wanted me to work from like noontime till closing, but he didn't want to pay for it. He only wanted to give me, say, two or three hours a day. So Bobby Paulson came and told him, you can't work, you, can, you can't work, you gotta go. I said, okay, so I did. In the meantime, the owner of the concession, he would come up and he'd get all upset because I wasn't there. I used to go in there and open up in the morning at noontime, stay till about one, and then I'd just hang around the park, and then I would go uh, home or whatever I wanted to do, and I'd come back to, to close up the concession. There was uh, gates that had to come down, the lights had to go off. And basically he got more hours from me than, uh, than he was paying, but I didn't care. I was, all I was 15, 16 years old. I also worked for uh, George Mazaki, uh, uh, and he also paid for part of the uh, schooling I had, uh, him and Bruno. Uh, this was a um, correspondence course that I took. But he, George picked up the tab for that, and um, I worked for him as a mechanic. Uh, the ski balls, the pinballs, and all the other mechanical machines. Half the machines in the place were all time mechanicals. They had a big spring that needed to be wound up every two or three days. And um, I enjoyed that job. I liked that job. That was, uh, that was, that was nice. I did a lot of stuff in there, a lot of fixing up. Yeah, on Sunday mornings, I would take George to church. Every Sunday, George would have a sack of money and I'd take him over to the Catholic church on Knox Avenue and he'd go inside He'd stand in the back of the church, I'd stand there with him with a bag of money, and eventually one of the priests came out, and he gave the bag of money to, uh, to him, George did. And I guess that's what his uh, contribution was. Uh, I was working in there as a maintenance mechanic during the days, and John Winkler and myself and a couple other guys were having lunch over in Patton Gary's, and I turned over to John and I said, John, I saw this, this big flume of black smoke coming up uh, over the, the back of the, the maintenance shop. And before I could even say anything else, John got up, he was gone. Then I figured something was up, so I jumped, I was right behind him. And uh, it turns out that the boathouse was on fire inside. I jump into the moat to get around to get to where the hydrant is. The hydrant is on an island in the middle of, of the ride. And I'm trying to put the hose on. And John Rinaldi comes over and says, turn on the water, turn on the water. And I, I said, John, it don't fit. So I took, I took the hose and I rammed it onto the threads and got a, a quarter of a turn on it and opened the valve up. And then they put the fire out before the fire department got there. In the meantime, that was the end of that. Uh, the boat house could have really, it was burning. And it could have really gone up. There was um, a drop light or something that had fallen onto gasoline. And at that time, they had gasoline motors in the boats. The bosses in the park that I had was uh, John Rinaldi and uh, John Winkler, Jerry Savinesso. We got along great. They were, that was the best guys I worked for. I'll tell you a quick story about the ice cream stand. Is that when Freddie Naso, he had the, the uh, waffles with the ice cream. He had that for years. Then all of a sudden there was no more ice cream. The sign was changed, it's cream. Well, what had happened was Irving got a new guy from Florida that came up and ran his custard stand. So the guy complained that 
Freddie was using ice cream, and it was taking away part of his profits. So Rosenthal told Freddie Nasif, no more ice cream on the waffles. And uh, that's what happened. They put the cream on it. I don't know if they ever recovered, but I know Freddie was pissed off about it because he, he wanted to put that, but they put the, they put the whipped cream on it. <laughs> Uh, my ex, my ex father-in-law worked. He had a hamburger joint there, Harry's Hamburger, and he had root beer. He was the only one that had the root beer that I can remember. Uh, Harry was a real good guy. Yeah. John and I went up on the on the uh, cyclone one year. And we, you know, we were both nuts. It was snowing. It was the middle of the winter, and we said, "Oh, we're going to go up on the cyclone." So we get up on the, start walking up the the uh, track to the cyclone to get up to the top. And we go from one to the other and then get over to the side that was facing the midway. And then I guess we both thought about it at the time that we're nuts. <laughs> at the time, I wasn't married. John had two children. So he turned around and came back down, but sliding down on our butts. We didn't walk up. We slid down all the way. And that was stupid on our parts, but Again, we were having fun. You know, we killed the time. There was another incident that happened up in the park that was with the fun house. We had just gotten finished with working, all of us, and I had gone home and I was getting ready to go to sleep. It was about midnight, I guess. And the, um, the whistle went off in town, the fire whistle. And I, like I said, I'm a, I was a uh, volunteer fireman. So bingo, out the door I go. I jump in the car. I don't even stop at the firehouse because now I don't know if the fire engine had gone already. So I kept going. I went up to the, because I found out it was the park. Went up to the park and I pulled in one of the uh, midways. And that's when we found out the front house was on fire. So we sat there for about, oh, about six or seven hours putting that out until finally we got pulled out of there. The, our chief was. Uh, Chief McGrath, and he got us out because they were having a war with uh, Fort Lee. Uh, Fort Lee had a volunteer chief. Our chief was a paid chief. And they had a little difference of opinion. To this day, I don't know what it was, but we left. Now, for a little history, uh, I know Vince had gone to Williamsport, uh, Pennsylvania, to get the uh, cyclone car. Uh, there's a little more to that. Vince did a great job on that, and that park was closed, but I had gone out there and I took uh, Johnny Winkler and uh, Joe, Joe is the guy that, from Canada, I can't remember his last name, but we all went out there, and uh, <laughs> Joe used to work for Mickey Hughes. Mickey Hughes lived on the property. So we go over to the house, John and myself, we sat outside, and Joe goes to knock on the door. He says, I come here for a meal. And so Mickey Hughes was on the phone or something inside. He didn't want to recognize Joe. Now him and Joe were, they were he, Joe worked for Mickey Hughes, God knows how many years, importing the rides from Germany and setting them up all across the United States and Canada. So finally we get into the, get back into my truck and we leave. Uh, but before we do that, we go around on the other side where the concessions were, and Mickey Hughes' wife was there. So Joe goes up to try to talk to her. She runs away, locks herself in one of the concessions, and Joe is laughing. We're all laughing because he's knocking on the door trying to get her to come out, and she wouldn't come out. Don't you remember me? <laughs> and she remembered him. She remembered him good and just didn't want to talk to him. So finally we turned around and we left, and Mickey Hughes uh, had asked us how we were staying for the races because there was a racetrack right there that he owned, and the amusement park was something that was attached to the racetrack. Uh, the amusement park is still out there, what's left of it, but it's not worth anything, uh, defunct. Um, and that was that, we came home, but uh, we had a good time there too. When I worked in the park as a police officer, uh, we, didn't, we didn't have any radios. All we had was a, 
a phone at the information desk, which was the communications, and then we'd have to call the operator, and she would make a page over the PA system for whatever the problem was, we would say where to go. And what it was is we would say, or she would say actually, Gladys Shelley, please go to the cyclone. Gladys Shelley, please go to the pool. And what turned out was Gladys Shelley was Uncle Irving's wife's name. Um, and it worked out to a point, uh, if you heard it, <laughs> we would get there. If you didn't hear the, the call go out, you never went out because like on weekends, it would be so loud that you could just about hear it. With Uncle Irving, I had one time, um, I got called, uh, it was on a weekday, to the um, casino bar, which was strictly an adult-only bar. And this kid was there with his, with his uncle and his aunt. Uh, he must have been about 14, 13, 14 years old. And Joe said, look, he's got to come out of here. He can't, he can't stay here. Uh, you got to get him out. So I said, okay. So I went over to the kid. I said, look, you got to leave. You're underage. You can't stay here. So I just turned around and was walking him out. And he plops down like I hit him, which I did not hit him. And then he looks up and he gives me the grin on, the, grin on his face like, mm, I got you. But anyway, what went on is that the mother and father showed up the next day with the our insurance adjuster from the park. I got called into the office before that, and Uncle Irving had, must have gotten a hold of Joe Sigatelli, who was the manager of that bar, and Joe told him exactly what I said, of my what I did, that I just tried to escort him out, and the kid went down and made like he got hit. So... I explained that all to Mr. Irving, and he said, okay, and that was it. I never heard anything else about it after that. The big part about that I did hear about was that the insurance adjuster gave this kid, or to his parents or somebody, $200 as a settlement, which was ridiculous because it didn't do nothing, and they were just looking for money. I had to meet Uncle Irving a couple of times. I liked the guy, you know, yeah, he was tough. It was his park. He didn't want anybody to dirty it. He, did, he wanted everything clean. And he used to make sure he would go pick up the garbage himself and put it in a container. The parade would start at number five school and we would all have white pants on and white shirts with our school numbers on them and marching all the way up from down there I was in number three school and up through Palisade Avenue and up to the park and, and we were there with families, all of us were there for the whole day. We got the ride tickets, we had the food, and it was just a great time. Everybody's always talking about the hole in the fence behind the park. Well, there is no hole in the fence. What was back there was I'll call them boulders, rocks. And they were not round or anything. They were square like you would build with these things. Well, that was the back of the park where the free act stage was, where uh, Freddie Nace's circus restaurant was. Uh, the whole back wall, which was originally a trolley line back there, going down to Edgewater. So <laughs> what I used to do is go to the back there and I had my brother with me, who was a year younger, and we'd climb up on the rocks. And we'd just go right, where we ended up all the time was alongside of the circus bar and restaurant. It was very easy to get in. There was nothing there to stop you. I mean, yeah, if you fell off the rocks, you got hurt. But we were uh, agile enough to get up around the rocks. And uh, that's where, where everybody says there's a hole in the fence. There was no fence, there was no hole back there. The guy with the lemonade stand was right. One lemon made two, um, two drinks, and they would mash up the lemon in there, put the sugar in, and line them all up. And then the water, they would put the water in separately. The big lemon in front of the lemonade stands, that was the cold water to go in to make the lemonade. And they would just open the faucet there and fill them up. There was never any lemonade in it. It was strictly a cover that went around the pipe to hide the water pipe. So that took care of that. 
uh, with the hot dogs, uh, they used to count the rolls. So you could bring in a pound of hot dogs, and I know people did it. I didn't do it because I wasn't there for it. But you could put the, your hot dogs on the grill, and if you had 10 hot dogs, and they were a dollar a piece, you took out a $10 bill. Well, eventually, you, you had to take a $10 bill out because you, they would count the rolls, and they would have too many uh, of a roll or a hot dog left over. I did go back to the area of the park, and I found ticket books and stuff that were thrown out on a parking lot. I just didn't want to be there for the death of the park. To me, it was a death. If they could only kept it to open, it would still be a great place to go to today because our kids miss out on that. And it was a great place.